Hi, I'm Connie from Southern Indiana, and I'm a Revive Our Hearts monthly partner. One reason I support this ministry is their faithfulness to good doctrine. Enjoy today's episode of Revive Our Hearts, brought to you in part by the monthly partner team. When Rebecca Ellerman visited the hospital to deliver her fourth child, she didn't realize what a journey she'd be embarking on. I woke up that morning and had kind of like a feeling in my stomach. It didn't seem like the other three births. The baby was born very easily, um, seven pounds, 14 ounces, right on time. There were there was nothing to be in the delivery that showed anything at all. But as soon as he was born, there was my bedside nurse, and her first words were, oh, it's another floppy. I kind of like looked around and I thought, what, what in the world does that mean? And I saw my OB, sweet woman, had delivered my other three children, and I saw her back up and just be staring at that baby with a deep concern. And it was her eyes on him that I just watched because I knew she knew um, that this wasn't gonna be easy and that maybe this this baby that she had just helped to be born wasn't gonna survive. This is the Revive Our Hearts podcast with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, author of You Can Trust God to Write Your Story. It's Friday, March 3rd, 2023. And I'm Dana Gresh. Dana, there are quite a few places in the scripture where God changed someone's name. Mm -hmm. The book of Genesis tells us that's what God did for Abram. Right. And Jacob. So he did. And then in the New Testament, Jesus changed the name of Simon. Ah, you know, I'm seeing a trend here. Well, today we're going to hear about a young man whose name was changed at a critical juncture in his life. Our guest today is Rebecca Ellerman. We know her as Becky. And Becky wanted to change the name of her son. And that story reveals something important about the relationship that Becky's family has with the Lord. Becky serves on the staff here at Revive Our Hearts. She's part of a team that reaches out to friends who support this ministry. She thanks them for their investment in Revive Our Hearts. She prays for them. She shares with them how they can become more connected to our various outreaches. And Becky is also one of our Revive partners herself. As am I, Nancy, and I love it. It's actually one of my favorite roles here at Revive Our Hearts. Revive partners play a really crucial role in helping us bring the Revive Our Hearts message to you each weekday and to women all over the world. And a partner simply agrees to do three things. Pray for the Revive Our Hearts ministry, share about the message of Revive Our Hearts, and make a financial gift each month to make it all possible. And Dana, it means so much to me that you and Bob are Revive partners. Mm -hmm. And Becky, listen to this, Becky and six other members of her family are all Revive partners. We're about to get to know this family better. And the story starts in that hospital delivery room. The doctors were rushing around trying to save the life of Becky's baby. And we had named him Trey Daniel Ellerman, and my pediatrician was the first one to say, I need to tell you that it looks like, preliminarily, that um, he has trisomy 21. Trisomy 21 is the medical term for Down syndrome. And he said, that's interesting that you named him Trey, because, like, try, Trey. And I didn't like it at all, to be honest. It all of a sudden seemed like a label, and it seemed like a mistake, the name. But Daniel was absolutely the word he was supposed to be named. And so I just stayed with that, and we started to hear reports from the NICU and the nurses that he had not only trisomy 21, but he had pulmonary hypertension, which is basically, in layman's terms, the heart and the lungs are not working well together. The doctors were looking at all sorts of numbers and panels, and they were incredible people uh, reporting to us everything. But all the information that was coming into me, what they would say is, Becky, we need to do this. Do we have your permission? And they would say, if you don't grant it, he won't make it. And I was like, well, then yes. So on day two, when they told me, he doesn't look like it's going to make it. And do you want to see him one more time? I walked through that NICU door, and 
They pointed him out, and he said, that's, that's him, that's Trey. And I just, I mean, I fainted. I, I fell into my friend's arms. I'm like, that cannot be my child. He was so blown up with medicine and steroids that he was just like a, he looked like you could take a pin and pop him. He was huge and not in a, a healthy way. And he was bouncing on this machine, and I just, I can't do it. I cannot do that. And so I came back to my room, and and I needed to be alone with the Lord. And I remember at that time, I said to the doctors, would it be okay if I change his name? And they're like, Becky, you can do anything you want. This is your child. And I just remember sitting there going, this is your child, Lord. It's not my will, but it's your will that will be done in this matter. He is your will. And I mean, like, I literally remember placing him with my mind and my heart into the Lord's hands and just saying, he's your will. And whatever you decide is yours. And so I changed his name to Will Daniel Ellerman. And it's probably been the greatest joy of knowing that that's where his name came from. When I was hearing so much information like he might not make it, I remember there was a bench outside of the hospital and it was right by a fountain. And I just found myself there a lot. It was September, so it was really pleasant and beautiful, and it was peaceful, and I love the sound of water, and I just felt really near the Lord there, and so that would be a place that I could just go and ponder and think and remind myself. I took my Bible out there, and I would just open it to His Word, or those messages that I was receiving from people, I would then look up the Scripture and underline them and date them. So I'm really grateful for that time and that place I could go. That was away from it all, that is where I think the Lord really grounded me that He's over this and that I am held and that Will's life is in His everlasting arms. But I I needed, as I do now, I need to come away with the Lord. And that place became a refuge for me that I, I went to almost every day, at least once, and would just be still with the Lord, with my Bible, and in prayer. I think just over and over again, it was it was that stillness of the Lord, and yet the movement of the water, realizing that the Spirit is still moving, and that He's still informing, and He's over this, and under this, and all around this, that it gave me a real confidence and trust that the Lord was working all things according to His will. As Becky came day by day to the Lord in desperation, Psalm 56, verse 3, became real in a whole new way. When I am afraid, I will put my trust in Thee, in God whose word I praise. And for my children, because they they lived in a hospital for a long time, it was a really scary place for them. We spoke that out of belief and trust and confidence that God was true to His word. We sang it, we believed it, we meditated on it, We lived it, and I think it really breathed life into all my kids, to to so much so that his sister that's just 11 months and three weeks older is now a NICU nurse in a level three hospital in Arkansas, and her first week on the job, uh, she called me in absolute tears saying, Mom, now I know what you lived through, like seeing these moms with these babies, and she had Down syndrome kids for her first week. And I think the reality of, like, this is God's purpose, and we just, no weapon formed against us shall prevail. I mean, this is His purpose for our life, and we're getting to see the goodness of God. Like Psalm 27 says, I would have despaired had I not believed I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord, be strong, take heart. Be of good courage, whichever version is, and wait on the Lord.
So kind of after that, beginning day three and going forward, I was actually enabled by the, the Spirit to be able to go into the NICU and actually look at him and smile. When you have a child that's got pulmonary hypertension on all these medicines, their counsel to me was, if you say a word to your child or speak or he hears your voice, he will likely go into cardiac arrest. At the same time, I'd gotten moved to another room, and these doctors and nurses came into the room and kind of laid out what they saw and the prognosis, and it was not good. And they said, we're probably going to have to put him on what's called an ECMO machine, and you can only be on that for about 10 days or he'll be brain dead. And he may be brain dead even if he goes on this ECMO machine. I was told I couldn't talk to him. I couldn't sing to him. I couldn't pray with him. He couldn't hear my voice. And so as a mother, to be told you could do harm to your child by speaking, I mean, that just didn't seem right. And yet, I just trusted God that he would work all this through. I had a friend come to see me about day 19 of this of this journey. And things were just kind of stable, and there wasn't a lot of improvement at all. And he had yet to open his eyes. When you have a child like Will, they're hypotonic, which means they don't have much energy or strength anywhere in their body. So they don't even have strength to open their eyes sometimes or lift their head or look around. They're dormant. And that's why that machine had to kind of do all the work. So what was beautiful about it is this friend came to me and she said, Becky, why in the world are they not letting you sing to your baby? Like I had a song that I sang to all my kids. The same song is a little silly song, but it's I'll Love You Forever. And I'd sung it to all of them. It's a book. We had read it to all my kids. They knew it. Will had heard it in utero. And I remember thinking, she's right. And she said, Becky, what if him hearing your voice actually brought life to him? Maybe he needs to hear your voice. What have you got to lose? So I prayed about it for two days. So I remember day 21, walking in that room, and I had the kindest nurse. And I said, I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing a song that I've always sung. I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. That was the moment his eyes opened for the very first time. Incomprehensible, really, that he knew my voice. And there were bells going on in the room. It was loud. But he stopped. He, he was still. He looked at me. I'll never forget it. And I knew that I had received like such a blessing from the Lord and also the awareness that, I mean, I was really there for a purpose for him as well. I was serving a purpose for the Lord with this baby. For the first year of his life, Will was in and out of hospitals. That includes one very dramatic moment right before Will's first Christmas. I had noticed that there was something not right with Will. And I remember I kept saying, he just doesn't look good. And I really don't know what's wrong. Becky took Will to a doctor's office located in a hospital. During that appointment, Will stopped breathing. The doctor sprang into action and gave Becky emergency instructions. We have to run and you need to pat him on the back, and you need to pray. And I mean, I ran, we ran from one end of that hospital to the other and went into a PICU. They said he literally is oxygenating in the 70s right now, which is not good. And they put a trach in him immediately, and I'd never even seen a trach before, didn't know one thing about it, and, and was amazed and astounded that he had lived three months without a trach, and the doctor was said, he has no airway. It's not even open. So all of a sudden, I'm thinking the pieces are coming together. He had to have a trach to live. So <laughs> fast forward six months later, he was well enough to be able to come home. He came home at a year as he was turning one, and he was on 41 meds a day that I would have to draw with a syringe. And the thing that had not been addressed yet was his heart. So all along, we needed to, get his, we needed to have him grow in weight so that he could actually have that heart surgery. 
Becky was waiting for Will to grow physically so doctors could perform surgery on his heart. During this time, Becky began to grow in her relationship with the Lord. He was getting truth deep into her heart. I was invited to my neighbor's house with some other young moms, and we did Lies Women Believe. Lies Women Believe is a book by Nancy Namas Walgamuth. And all of a sudden, I got to know, like, Nancy on the radio and hearing her voice teaching, and um, it, it just became our daily routine with my kids and everything. We just listened to Nancy. You know, anything that makes me need God is a blessing. And I always felt like Nancy was in my living room teaching just to me when she would teach. And I just, I was desperate. And I probably didn't even know how desperate I was, but I know that it was a lifeline to me. Becky wanted to share that lifeline with others, so she joined the Revive Our Hearts monthly partner team, Revive Partners. That meant she told others about Revive Our Hearts, she prayed for the ministry, and she supported the ministry financially each month. I just wanted to be a part of seeing what God was doing in lives all around the world. I mean, I just, I grabbed heart of it. And the monthly partner program was really just being unfolded in 2007. And I was first to jump on and say, yes, I want to be a monthly partner. I want to give to this ministry that is given to me, but I'm also getting to see how it's impacted my own family and just women that I'm in life with. In 2009, Becky was excited to travel to Little Rock, Arkansas for a Revive Our Hearts recording session. Becky's son, Luke, was 13 at the time, and he came too. I remember being uh, one of maybe a small handful of, of men there, which at first was different for me, but became very comfortable early on and really loved to see other women like my mom, who were passionate about the same things, was really cool and instrumental in, in my own faith. The whole time we were there was on Proverbs 31, and the verse that continued to, to come to mind even today when I think back is smiling at the future and laughing at the future, and it could not have been a more perfect passage or perfect chapter to, to read through for, for somebody who lives out what the Proverbs 31 woman is. Luke was just a teenager when God spoke to his heart at that recording session, but it made such a big impression on him that a few years later, he became a revived partner. He and his wife, Megan, are still part of the team. I've seen the impact that even a small dollar amount can do for the sake of the kingdom, uh, for the sake of the gospel. We're all impacted by that, and it's a, it's a small way of thinking an organization, but also investing into something that I believe is very focused on discipling women of all ages from all places around the world. So in this family, Becky, Luke, and Megan are all monthly partners, but they're not the only Revive partners in this family. Becky's daughter, Annie, remembers listening to Revive Our Hearts with her mom, and she remembers her mom sharing resources from Revive Our Hearts during small group discussions. All growing up, I don't really remember our house not being used for something ministry-oriented or my mom getting to pour into women. The door opened for a group of young moms with young children to come around my house every week, and we went through Lies Women Believe and Adorned and Seeking Him together and some other resources as well. I think that I saw myself in the place of these young moms when I was a young mom myself and had four little babies. And I really did not know how to do this well. And I I didn't know who was gonna come. I mean, we've, you know, I just put it in his hands and more and more came and it was just an amazing experience, even for my daughters. They were part of it too. They would watch the little kids while we would be doing this Bible study. Here's Becky's daughter, Sarah Payton. I just remember my sister and I, um, would peep over the counter. We would <laughs> walk downstairs, act like we were getting water <laughs> um, from the fridge, and we would just like peek over. And I just remember thinking to myself how many women in their 20s really wanted to know the Lord more, really studied His Word. I just remember being excited that they were all there. I thought it was so cool that there were older 20-year-old women who wanted to be there and get poured into. Um, and they had a deep hunger to know Him. And I think that's even affected me more than I can even imagine right now in my in my 20s. My girls 
They're the same way that we all are. We learn by observation. We learn by living it out and seeing it. And we they just got to see life in our home. I mean, there was just a lot of flourishing. <laughs> and so it just was a, even if I didn't realize it in the moment, a really shaping um, perspective for me to get to see how no matter how old you are, you still have to be poured into. I think Revive Our Hearts has been important to my family because it's brought us together. It's just something that we can all talk about. We all remember memories of my mom from a young age listening. If my mom had not connected with Revive Our Hearts, I don't know if I would have known how to cultivate an intimate relationship with the Lord um, because my mom has. She has pointed me and shown me what it looks like to wake up into a abide or cultivate that relationship with the Lord. Um, and so I don't know where I would be. I don't even know if I would know how to study my Bible um, at this age. In 2016, Becky, Sarah Payton, and Annie all attended the True Woman 16 conference hosted by Revive Our Hearts. I remember coming to the 2016 conference in the fall and hearing teaching, and I'm, I'm once again, I heard it all the time in, um, on the phone or in the car on the way to school or whenever it was, but I remember hearing it in person for the first time. It affected me differently. Like, I just remember hearing it and getting to experience it. While at True Woman 16, Sarah Payton and Annie both heard an invitation to join the Revive Partners, and God put it on their hearts to get involved. Giving was something that was always talked about and encouraged in our home, um, whether it be giving our time or our money. It was just always something that we did. And so seeing my mom give and be a monthly partner to this ministry and seeing how much she was poured into and how much she was actually participating by giving, it was a unique ministry that I got to see um, and wanted to do the same. Being an 18-year-old, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to do it, but just as my mom always says, when you give, the Lord will bless you in return. And so I believed that to be true, and I wanted to see it to be true. And so I just decided to, at the end of that conference, become a monthly partner, and I've been one ever since. I became a monthly partner that uh, that conference and um, remember just not having much of an income. I was a sophomore in college and I was like, I don't really know how I'm going to do this, but I just know I get to be, get to do it because I have been blessed with some income and I get to be generous with what I have been given. So Becky, Luke, Megan, Sarah Payton, Annie, and her husband Wyatt are all Revive Partners. And there's also one other person in the family to join the team. When we last heard about Will, he was waiting to grow big enough for heart surgery. So we tried at when he turned four, and we tried to do it non-invasively, and it failed. Then we tried again, non-invasively, it failed. So it required heart, open heart surgery. So we did that when he was about four and a half years old, and that was a breakthrough day. What started to happen was the color of Will's life started to really come about. And so instead of just the necessity of surviving, we started to see life could be flourishing. After he had his heart surgery, God started to just build upon his life things that he was able to do, and the door started to open up, and opportunities were coming open for him. And he started to say, I want to uh, have my dream job, and I want to work at Park City's Presbyterian Church. Sarah Payton works at the church as well and gets to see her brother in action. So Will is a facilities man. It's fun to have him be a part of the church and see him around, and I'll run into him at times, and he'll throw a chair on the on his back and act kind of cool, and will act like he's, you know, running the show. I remember one time I was sitting in an all-staff meeting, and one of the bosses over Will came up to me and was like, Will has changed my perspective of life. They said, it's changed the way I see my job. It's changed the way I take the trash out. It's changed the way I set up chairs. It's changed all those things just because of the joy that Will has and how grateful he is to do it. I mean, he says all the time, like, I love my job. It changes the way that I see the mundane things in in life. So he's our biggest encourager and just brings so much joy to our family. Along with working in facilities at the church, Will began giving to others in all kinds of ways. 
God put several passions on Will's heart. I want to be our pastor's prayer person, and I want to be on mission staff with Young Life Capernaum, which is a special needs part of Young Life. And today, we're seeing all of those. I mean, every one of them has come about. And I want to be a monthly partner with Revive Our Hearts. If you've been blessed by the Revive Our Hearts daily program, or any of the other podcasts produced by this ministry, or if you've benefited from some of our books and resources, or conferences, or online articles and videos, you can thank our whole team of Revive partners, including Will Ellerman, who, by the way, has become a precious friend of Robert's and mine. And also, the rest of Will's family have become Revive partners. Rebecca, Luke, Megan, Sarah Payton, and Annie and Wyatt Despain. This family and their heart for this ministry has been such a deep encouragement to me and to countless others around the world who've been blessed because of their partnership with us. Now, as you've listened to this family story today, I wonder if the Lord may be calling you to join them and become a Revive partner. And they've said yes to the Lord when it seemed like they didn't have a lot to give but they had a heart to serve and to share. Perhaps today the Lord is calling you to do the same. To get more details, including all the goodies we have for you in the Revive Partner Welcome Pack, be sure and visit reviveourhearts.com. It's also where you can see the video our team made with Will and his family. It's precious. You can see him in action, working with all his heart at the church and sharing the joy of the Lord with others. To see the video, visit reviveourhearts.com and look for the transcript of today's program. Or you can subscribe to the Revive Our Hearts channel on YouTube. On Monday, we'll hear a message Nancy gave while a lot of people were going through stress and difficulty. She helped them to lean on their good shepherd to find rest. And she'll help you do the same. Join Nancy Monday here on Revive Our Hearts. Revive Our Hearts with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth is calling you to greater freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.